welcome everyone to, to Link Past. Uh, Link Past uh, is the conference focused on the uh, link open data and linking information and application to its, uh, the historical context and the digital humanities. Uh, this time uh, is hosted by the University of London and the British Library and have been previously edition as, um, in Madrid, in Stanford, in Mainz, uh, many, among other places. Um, we are here today for, for a keynote by Sara Tonelli and I will introduce Sara in a bit. Before this, I'll give you a couple of other important information on the event and on the last few events of Link Past, which will end uh, tomorrow. Uh, so first of all, some technical information. Uh, as I was saying, you can use the chat for having conversations, shared links, and send information with each other. But if you have any specific question for, for Sarah or for the panelists, uh, just use the Q&A button down in, uh, in Zoom. Um, okay, this was one. The other important information, uh, tomorrow we have the final activity reports at 4 p.m. London time, and then the closing of the symposium. So Thank you everyone for all the, your activities and thank you for all the feedbacks and everything. It has been like, it has been intense, but it has been great. And thank Gabby and the other uh, organizer because it has been lots of work and yeah, it has been fun. So um, remember to tweet about the event and tweet about the keynote and, and everything. Um, I think we are more or less ready to start. I hope I mentioned all the things that I wanted to mention. So I'll start with a quick introduction uh, for Sara. So Sara is head of the Digital Humanities Research Group at the Foundation Bruno Kessler in, in Trento since 2013. And Sara has a background in natural language processing and she has been working in many European uh, research pro projects at the intersection of uh, natural language processing, digital humanities, event modeling over the years. Uh, I knew Sara since 2014 because I was there doing an internship and we started working together and we have been working on many projects uh, uh, during the year. So I know her work very well and I'm really excited to, to see this talk because I think she will touch upon many interesting projects for the last few years. Um, another important thing from Sara, so she's part of the Audio, uh, Audio Europa Consortium and they super recently won uh, a new grant and it will be probably Sarah will say something about it otherwise I'm like spoil like send some spoilers but it it's a really good uh, new research project I'll put some links in the chat on uh, negotiation olfactory and sensory experience in cultural heritage practice and research so it, it's gonna be exciting and I'm really curious to see the outcome of this so I think we are ready to go so feel free to start Sarah and thanks so much Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation and thanks, uh, Federico. Indeed, it's been a pleasure to collaborate uh, with you over the years. Um, so today I'm going to give an overview of some past activities related to uh, linking uh, persons' names and uh, events in large amounts of text, mainly for digital history projects uh, using uh, natural language processing. So this event is called uh, linked past, so I don't need to explain what is linking, but in my talk I will focus on uh, uh, linking that is performed automatically by, um, by a software. So usually this kind of softwares uh, that link uh, given free text uh, to um, Wikipedia pages is called, uh, um, so the, the, the task is called the Wikification. Um, and basically uh, what it does is what you can see in this screenshot. So you give a text passage, the tool identifies concepts, uh, places, uh, persons uh, uh, that uh, have a Wikipedia page explaining this concept and uh, uh, introduces sets automatically um, a link. So this is an example, a text passage that I copied uh, uh, from the web and the, the tool that, that does this is uh, it's called the Wiki Machine and it was developed by some colleagues uh, at Fondazione Bruno Kessler uh, around 10 years ago. And uh, for example, what it did is to, to understand that Alphonse Mucha is, uh, uh, was an artist and uh, set the link to the, the correct DBpedia page. And all the concepts and words, and words that you see highlighted in the text were connected to, to a page. Um, 
the interesting part um, is that this machine works uh, uh, like a worse sense disambiguation system. So Wikipedia and uh, the DBpedia sense repository knowledge base, which is uh, uh, below, behind uh, uh, Wikipedia, is considered like a large repository of, uh, uh, of senses. Um, and more or less, these are the steps that these uh, tools perform. So I took these from uh, this uh, representation Presentation from the web page of uh, DBpedia Spotlight, which is another similar tool that does the wikification. So basically, when you give a text an input, first uh, um, the words uh, and the, the concepts are recognized. Um, for concepts that may have uh, um, potentially a Wikipedia page, the uh, list of candidates are selected because, you know, in, in Wikipedia you have, uh, for many concepts, uh, a so-called uh, disambiguation page where all the possible senses um, are listed. Then the tools perform. The tool performs disambiguation. So among all these senses, the best uh, is chosen that uh, um, fits uh, the meaning of this word in a context. Uh, and then uh, the output is filtered according to some uh, uh, criteria. For example, uh, um, the confidence score of, uh, of the classifier. And what is interesting is that this is done uh, using a supervised uh, machine learning. So basically, uh, a model is trained, so a tool is trained uh, in order to recognize uh, the context, the textual context around a word, and based on this context to assign the correct word sense. So I put here three examples of Washington, um, and each example links to a different uh, Wikipedia page. In the first case, uh, it's George Washington. Uh, in the second case, is Washington DC, so the, the city. And in the third case, is uh, Denzel Washington. The um, wikification tool, the linking machine, recognizes, for example, that uh, around the third dimension in the text, uh, there is a uh, um, film mentioned, uh, figures, and uh, uh, terminology that uh, refers to acting. And in this case, uh, using this uh, um, contextual information of the sentence is able to assign the, the, correct, uh, the correct sense. And as I said, Wikipedia is treated as a huge training corpus. And each sentence that contains a link, uh, a, a term that is linked to some page, is seen as a training example. Uh, so, for example, using this, uh, this approach, uh, then the different uh, mentions of Washington are linked to the, to the corresponding page. Um, what we can do, uh, I mean, probably the, the most, uh, the easiest way to, to use these uh, wikification tools is to create uh, very quickly novel uh, Wikipedia pages, because basically you get uh, in output a, a page, a text that has the same layout of, uh, of a Wikipedia page, so with um, links set to other pages. But the most fascinating thing to me is that uh, after you link, you have access to, uh, as I said, the background information that is structured to some extent, and that allows you to automatically set uh, connections between pages, uh, relations like the one that I'm, um, that I'm showing here. So uh, you can uh, identify which people lived in the same uh, time as other people, where they lived, what uh, they created, what they painted. So you have access to a uh, sort of of knowledge graph that can be actually represented by different knowledge bases. In the case of Wikipedia and our approach, we relied on DBpedia because uh, um, it is a resource that was created starting from Wikipedia info boxes and that basically encodes in a structured way what you find in, uh, in Wikipedia pages. Um, so we used this approach and we tried to exploit this background information coming from uh, DBpedia in, uh, as I said, in different uh, projects. So uh, one um, project that we had that was uh, um, led by a PhD student uh, of mine, uh, Stefano Menini, uh, was focused on studying uh, Nixon and Kennedy's uh, presidential uh, uh, speeches in their uh, campaign uh, uh, in 1960. 
and uh, um, we tried to see if we could use linking to infer some information about uh, the mentioned person that was not contained in text. So to use this background information to add something or infer something that uh, we could not know just by reading the, the text. So we mixed uh, uh, natural language processing and linking uh, um, in the way that I'm going to, to show you now. So the first step was basically run a named entity recognizer, so a tool that recognizes person's mentions in a text. Uh, so we obtained something like this. So in some cases, we observed that there were lists of, pers of persons that uh, um, were usually mentioned together. So our idea was that similar to distributional uh, uh, hypothesis where you, uh, you can say that the meaning of a word is given by uh, all the words that are in the co that appear in the context of this given word, so that the surrounding word contributes to creating the meaning of a word. Uh, similarly, we uh, argued that probably uh, who a person is can be um, identified, described also by looking at the company of uh, of this person in text. So who is mentioned together with this person, and in particular co-occurring uh, mentions that tend to appear often together. So um, starting from this, uh, this, link, this uh, named entity recognition step, we built the network of co-occurring persons where each node is a person and we set edges between two, uh, two persons that were mentioned together. And the more they appear together in a certain context, in a certain um, window of text, the, the thicker the edge um, became. So you can see on the, on the left a general representation of this kind of a network, um, and on the right uh, a detail of this, where there are uh, these persons that appear in the passage above, uh, how they are represented in this kind of, uh, of network. And you can see um, that there are clusters of nodes that can be very clearly identified, meaning that these persons appear together frequently in the corpus that we, that we analyzed. So the next step was to see how we can uh, uh, link then these persons to, to Wikipedia and infer additional information about uh, the, the nodes and the clusters. For example, our idea was that uh, uh, people that tend to occur together maybe share some characteristics, some categories. So using the background information, we can maybe infer the category they, they belong to and like assign a label to these clusters or click of, uh, of notes. Um, so we developed an algorithm that tried to, to do this. So given uh, a cluster of nodes, we tried to link each of these persons. Uh, in some cases, or in most cases, we could link some of them, but not all, uh, because when you deal with uh, um, corpora from the past, um, you don't usually you don't have all the mentions represented in Wikipedia. There are some minor figures, uh, um, minor politicians uh, that uh, um, were not so relevant maybe and that therefore did not uh, deserve to have uh, a Wikipedia page. Um, so for those that uh, we could link to uh, Wikipedia, then we uh, obtained from DBpedia the uh, category that described them. So for example, uh, you see that for Theodore Roosevelt and Franklin Roosevelt, for both, we could automatically assign the president category for a gift for pinch or the governor category because, uh, um, as I said, DBpedia somehow uh, assigns to Wikipedia pages also a structure, a hierarchical structure where pages are grouped into, uh, into categories. So in this case, we could assign three categories to, to three people in a, in a group and for one, we could not retrieve anything. So the next step was to see uh, which was the prevalent category. In this case, we had two private presidents and one governor. So what we did was to go up uh, in the um, DBpedia hierarchy of categories and to um, find the one that includes all the leaves that we found. So the, the one that was uh, uh, one step higher, so the ancestor of our, uh, our leaves was a politician. 
So we inferred that uh, the cluster of these people could be labeled as a cluster of politicians and also that uh, Wendell Wilkie was uh, uh, likely to be a politician. So in this way, we were able not only to assign a category to persons who had no Wikipedia page, just guessing or inferring this from the background information that we were able to link, and also to assign categories to these clusters of nodes, to these clicks. Um, two is also navigation, because we realized that when you have a large corpora, you really have huge person networks, and it's difficult uh, to understand who is represented unless you zoom in and you really look at each single node. In this case, we had macro categories and this is the, uh, the, the navigation and the exploration of, uh, of the network. Um, so in the end, this is what we, what we obtained. So we identified clusters for politicians, uh, artists, uh, volleyball players, um, and so on. And this was interesting because in the end, in this corpus, we were not able to link uh, around 50% of the, of the entities. Uh, and with this process, uh, instead, we, we, we could add information also for, uh, for those who had no, uh, no page, uh, for the, um, Nixon and Kennedy case, for example, we uh, were able to um uh, to identify around 900 uh, click and we also saw so groups of, of nodes and we also evaluated them uh, manually and we found that for uh, the um, click labeling so when we assign uh, um, a category at the level of, of a group of nodes we had an F1 score of 72 so it was uh, not bad um, for single nodes uh, it was around 60 so um, sometimes Sometimes we made uh, mistakes, uh, but uh, nevertheless, for those persons, we wouldn't uh, find uh, any other information uh, anywhere. Um, so I'm tried, I, I tried to, to summarize what we did. Actually, this is the, the pipeline that uh, describes in more detail what, uh, what we did. So the NLP part was a, a bit more complex in the sense that uh, in order to extend the number of named entities of persons that we recognized in text, we added also a coreference resolution step so that uh, we could assign uh, to a node also um, persons that were mentioned with just with pronouns. Um, and then uh, we also like cleaned the, 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 the first network by merging together mentions uh, of the same person that had some small orthographic variations or acronyms or, uh, um, yeah, so we, we perform uh, name normalization. But then in the end, as I said, we, we did the network creation, uh, we linked and through the Bpedia, we performed both entity labeling and click labeling uh, completely automatically. Um, another, um, another experiment, another project that we, we carried out um, involved this time uh, Italian documents and we worked quite a lot with uh, um, the public documents by Alcide de Gaspri who was a prominent Italian uh, politician, one of the founding fathers of European Union. Um, so very, very important and he, he left an archive, uh, digital archive of more than 3,000 uh, documents. Again, we used uh, automatic linking of uh, uh, cited persons and we connected them to the Wikipedia because uh, we had a project with a group of history scholars who were interested in analyzing the um, rhetorical strategy by the Gasperi. And uh, in particular, if uh, uh, what was his attitude with respect to the past and to the future, uh, well, year after year, uh, because this uh, collection of documents covers around uh, 50 years of uh, European history from, uh, uh, so the first half of the, uh, of the 20th century is, um, is covered by this archive. And so they wanted to see if we could uh, automatically detect a change of attitude looking at uh, the persons, uh, the events, uh, and the use of the language that he, he applies uh, um, in these uh, documents or in these uh, uh, speeches. Um, so as a first thing, we looked, of course, at uh, uh, verbal tense, for example, the use that he made of 
past, uh, present, and future tenses. But another thing that we did was to see if uh, uh, he used to mention more people belonging to the past or to the present, to uh, contemporaneous uh, with, uh, with the Gasperi. So in order to analyze this, again, we resorted to uh, linking and the DBpedia. In particular, we, um, uh, we ran the wiki machine, so the, the, the linking uh, tool on the, the whole corpus, and we were able to, to link some persons to, to DBpedia. And then we exploited the temporal information that is encoded in DBpedia, in particular the birth date and the death date of people, which is uh, quite precise, uh, so well curated in, um, in Wikipedia info boxes and therefore in, in DBpedia. And we use them to infer if these persons were uh, alive at the same time when the Gaspari uh, wrote uh, uh, the documents or if they uh, were, had already died. So in the first case, uh, in the second case, we would say they belong to the past or uh, to the present of, uh, of the Gaspar. And we tried to track if there, was some, some trend, there were some trends that changed uh, uh, over time. In particular, since this archive was organized into four volumes following a chronological order, we were able to compare the people belonging to the past and to the present that were most mentioned in the four volumes of the, um, of the collection. And indeed, we observed, uh, we observed the change, so we observed the trend. When uh, in the first volume, so when the Gaspari was young, he uh, looked at the, um, um, at the distant past and uh, the persons that he mentioned were very, belonging to very different categories, artists, uh, philosophers, uh, um, even Karl Marx, although the Gaspari was uh, uh, the founder of Christian Democratic Party, so probably did not agree with Marx's uh, um, ideas, but uh, yeah. um, he mentioned very often uh, the, the education, the fact that he studied, uh, um, he was trying to, to increase his background and his knowledge, whereas uh, year after year he became a prominent politician and uh, in the end he uh, almost exclusively, exclusively spoke about uh, politicians, politics, and so both people from the past and from the present were from these, uh, from these categories of politicians. This is more evident probably in this uh, representation where for each volume uh, you can see the proportion of people belonging to the past and to the present mentioned uh, in the documents uh, and the corresponding uh, category. So for the first volume, for example, people from the past uh, are politicians, monarchs, clerics, as I said, uh, musicians, uh, uh, philosophers. Uh, for volume three and four, uh, the present dimension is more prevalent. And the people from the past are, again, uh, almost ex exclusively politicians. So there is really a change of attitude that we could detect and measure automatically using a combination of um, NLP and, um, and linking and inferring uh, temporal information from uh, biographical data associated uh, with, uh, with these persons. Um, we could also observe, this is another view of, uh, of the same results that I just presented. So um, on the, on the x-axis, you can see the different years of publication of the documents in the archive and how the mentions of people from the past and for the, from the present time change uh, throughout the, the archive um, uh, yeah, over the, the different volumes. Um, then we tried to see if we could do something similar with events. Because uh, in a DBpedia, some pages have been categorized under the uh, event category. So we wanted to see if uh, through linking and uh, extracting information from DBpedia, we could also see if the Gaspari mentioned more events from the past or that were contemporary or from the near past. Uh, so below you see an example. It's in Italian, but the important part is that he mentioned a battle of um, Vittorio Veneto, which was an important uh, battle mm. that basically ended uh, World War, the First World War for, for Italy. Um, and then uh, through uh, DBpedia, we can again go up the, the hierarchy of categories and we land to the events. Uh, events one. 
And uh, in this way, we could link some, uh, some mentions. Uh, in the Wikipedia, we took the, the date, begin and end date of these events. And again, we were able to categorize uh, um, these events as be, uh, belonging to the past and uh, the distant past or uh, to the present. We observed, uh, again, um, we, we, we made a few observations that I think were interesting. So, for example, um, a risorgimento, uh, so basically the Italian unification is mentioned frequently throughout all the archive, uh, whereas the events from classical um, era and from a distant past prevail in the first volume, similarly to the mentioned persons. So um, because he talks ma uh, more about uh, culture, uh, what he studies, whereas uh, towards the end, uh, the mentioned events are more events about war, uh, World War II, and uh, uh, in the last volume, the, the Cold, um, Cold War um, is, already, is already mentioned. Um, so this was, I think, rather interesting, but uh, it had, compared to the, the, the mention of persons, it had, uh, in our view, uh, several limitations. First of all, events were not so well represented because Wiki, uh, Wikipedia and, in turn, Wikipedia contain only specific types of events that are large historical events. Uh, most of them are connected, are war events. Mm. So a large amount of events that probably could be of interest for in uh, uh, digital history projects uh, are not included in this, uh, in this repository. Um, so we saw that there are more than 77,000 uh, uh, pages classified as events in, uh, in Wikipedia, but uh, uh, they be most belong to just four uh, macro categories. Um, so probably, we don't have here the, the granularity that would be useful and needed um, for, uh, as I said, for digital history projects. So we tried to adopt a different perspective to, to, to see if uh, working bottom up, so starting from the text and then going up to the hierarchy or a classification could be more, uh, um, more useful. And if we could draft some um, modeling, some idea on how to model uh, interesting uh, events. Um, so coming from uh, NLP, um, um, we observed that uh, there have been several attempts to modern and to annotate events uh, in, in corpora. And indeed, there are a number of annotation schemes and proposals to, to capture events. I, I put here uh, just four, but there are many more. Um, there, here I put ACE, Event Nugget, TimeML, FrameNet, uh, all the, um, the, 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 the words that you see in a, in a red frame are somehow defined as events in the corresponding uh, in the corresponding schemes uh, so you see that they don't match with each other they have different granularity and also each scheme focuses on different aspects for example uh, time ml is more focused on temporal information and relation between events uh, framenet is more um, focused on uh, um, situations and also the roles played by participants in uh, in these events uh, so it's difficult to choose uh, a scheme a guideline that uh, Mm, that uh, may be correct and uh, that may be useful uh, for, uh, for history scholars. So as part of uh, um, her PhD work, a student that I supervised, Raquel Sprugnoli, carried out an in-depth analysis of this, uh, this aspect. Um, and she actually organized, uh, launched a um, survey involving uh, more than 70 um, respondents uh, uh, through many lists for, for history scholars in English and Italian, where she uh, asked to uh, answer some questions about the notion of event in their daily work as history scholars, as I said. Uh, and she also proposed an annotation exercise uh, to understand what they, cons what they did consider a useful event to annotate um, and to compare the annotation choices that, uh, that they made. And uh, um, the outcome of this, of this survey um, helped us uh, understanding uh, um, 
how events uh, should be annotated uh, and modeled. For example, from this survey, we, um, the, the suggestion was that uh, the notion of event should not be dependent on a grammatical category. So in linguistics, we tend to, see, to, to say, I don't know, all verbs should be, um, should be annotated as event. Instead, here from what they proposed uh, in their annotation exercise was that uh, concepts uh, uh, belonging to different grammatical categories could be seen and annotated as, as events. Also, um, some uh, linguistic guidelines suggest that events should be, um, as events, we should annotate just the head of um, of a phrase, so just one word. Instead, in this exercise, we saw that uh, um, they suggested to annotate multi-tokens, so uh, expressions that correspond to events that are composed by uh, several uh, um, several terms, and to allow for these continuous annotations. Um, also, that uh, both states and conditions should be considered um, as events. Um, and then uh, that it was very important to uh, assign also a semantic tag, a semantic category to, to the events in order to make use of them in, uh, in, their, uh, in their studies. And in particular, this is a, um, a survey of the outcomes. So we, we asked to, to judge uh, as very important somewhat important, not important, or don't know, uh, some aspects that they could, um, some important properties of, of events that we, that we suggested taken from the literature. And we saw that uh, the, um, the, the property that was considered most important was, uh, as I said, the event type. So the possibility to categorize and classify um, the events that we found um, mentioned in, uh, in the text. Um, so as an outcome of her thesis, Raquel also um, wrote some, uh, some annotation guidelines that were um, tried to, to address all these uh, suggestions and that uh, uh, we wanted to, to propose to uh, history scholars for, uh, uh, for their projects and that are, um, by the way, freely, freely available. And in particular, she, she did... Um, uh, a huge work trying to suggest uh, some meaningful semantic uh, categories and semantic classes for uh, events to be uh, annotated in, uh, in, in historical archives, for example. Um, and she started from uh, the historical thesaurus of the Oxford English Dictionary, and she reduced the categories there to 22 semantic classes that uh, um, could well represent different uh, uh, relevant uh, um, event types. Um, and she also um, carried out uh, some uh, annotations to show how uh, these uh, semantic categories could be uh, indeed applied uh, um, and found in, in, real, uh, in real text. So in the end, um, she, she drafted, we drafted together these guidelines and uh, um, also she conducted this, uh, this corpus annotation. Um, this was on the one hand, uh, um, I think, uh, useful also for us to understand the needs uh, coming from this uh, uh, research community. On the other hand, it was a completely um, bottom up. So um, at some point we, we wanted to see if this, uh, uh, this approach could be linked to the, the, the modeling part, the, the linked open, open data uh, part. Um, and about this, I still have some doubts in the sense that, for example, I took these four sentences that we um, that were included in the in the annotated corpus, and I ran a linking machine the linking machine on them. Um, the outcome is that uh, not all uh, uh, events that we uh, annotated manually have a corresponding Wikipedia page. Uh, and also those that have one, for example, uh, trial or, or uh, rest, uh, link to a page that is not useful to infer any information about this event. For example, trial, if I'm not wrong, is connected to the page about um, process. Um, so um, that, um, we, we understood that using uh, linking on top of this kind of annotation would not uh, help us uh, um, 
help us uh, uh, much. Uh, so we looked for other, other uh, existing uh, repositories, other ways to model what we had in mind, as I said, to try to uh, bring together the, the bottom-up approach with the, the top-down one, so a way to also to model at a higher level events and their relations. Um, one example that we considered was, was FrameNet, because uh, this is uh, a project that started with corpus annotation, annotation of frames that are, um, in general terms, uh, can be defined as situations or uh, broad events um, that have um, a, started with the corpus annotation, but uh, have also um, a representation of the events as a graph, a sort of ontology with relations uh, set manually defined between frames that to some extent uh, would allow uh, to, to run some inferences, for example. And I think that it's a very successful um, project, although um, it has the goal to be comprehensive, so to, to, to model every type of, uh, of events. And probably for uh, digital history projects where uh, scholars are interested in specific types of events, this is too broad. So we, we also had this experience that when we wanted to, to study some phenomena, we use the frame net and, uh, and annotated frames, uh, but uh, working with uh, sub parts of these uh, huge graphs. So selecting specific uh, frames. For example, um, we worked on a project trying to understand the trajectories of notable people. Uh, so how they moved uh, in the first half of the 20th century. So how some events affected the mobility of uh, intellectuals, of uh, uh, yeah, notable uh, um, notable people and for that project um, we focus on the set of frames in framenet that describe uh, movements or uh, people uh, uh, displacements uh, um, so going from one place uh, to the other. So we, we selected a subgroup of frames and uh, we used this information to, to model what we could uh, extract from, uh, from text. Um, so for example, you see on, on the left uh, a representation of uh, movement in this uh, from 1917 to 1922. And you can see that the blue bar um, located in Russia is represents uh, the um, aristocracy leaving uh, St. Petersburg after the, the, the Red uh, Revolution, for example, or in the, in the representation on the, on the right, um, you see people moving from uh, Europe to the US um, as a consequence of uh, the Nazi regime and then uh, uh, World War II. So uh, these notable people uh, we observed were mostly uh, Jewish intellectuals and scientists that uh, moved, uh, uh, escaped basically to to US. So for this kind of projects, I think that uh, um, resorting to a subgroup of frames could be could be useful. And then, by the way, FrameNet is also um, released as is also part of uh, of uh, linked open data. Um, we know there have been. Uh, 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 also other attempts to, to model um, events. Um, uh, for example, I found this, uh, uh, this work, to, this work uh, um, about linked open vocabularies where the authors uh, tried to connect and make available different uh, linked open vocabularies. And I looked at the part related to, to events. So what you see in the, um, in the center is the representation of uh, the event ontology, which was a proposal probably one of the first made in 2004 to uh, model and propose a model for, for events that is uh, uh, generic. Um, and then you see uh, in these, uh, as linked open data, other proposals related to events. And you see that in blue, uh, the authors highlighted the, the, the ontologies and the proposals that specialize the event ontology. You see that most attempts go towards this direction. So um, with, the, with the goal to specialize uh, a, broad, uh, a broad modeling of, of events, because 
what what I think my 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 opinion is that uh, when you try to to apply this broad definition in specific uh, domains and documents, you need uh, addition, to define additional uh, additional information. So I think that this shows uh, some tendency uh, towards uh, towards uh, um, specialization and uh, uh, specification. Um, so I um, I would like to 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 conclude my my talk. I don't know if uh, my my message was uh, was clear. So what I learned from uh, the past projects that, that, that I presented was that uh, when we worked uh, with the persons and used entity linking. Um, to infer additional information about these persons, to um, add temporal uh, information. This was done effectively, even if uh, the linking tools that we use uh, um, perform uh, um, automatic linking. So to some extent, they can make mistake, uh, mistakes. <clears throat> But when you work with large corpora, um, then nevertheless, I think that it's still uh, it's still uh, useful. On the other hand, when we tried to to work on events, we realized that uh, uh, it's more problematic. So using just a linking, a linking to Wikipedia and to DBpedia uh, is not enough because the coverage of events uh, uh, focuses on um, mainly on military um, events. Uh, looking for a bottom-up uh, um, approach is interesting and we obtain some insights from this survey but nevertheless it it is difficult to um, find uh, annotation guidelines that can uh, um, match with uh, um, the, the modeling uh, part. So the idea that, uh, that I have uh, is that uh, uh, if you work in specific domains, probably um, different granularities uh, in, the, um, in the event definition um, are needed and therefore uh, every time we need to, to specify um, a bit also the the guidelines and the ontology if we want to also to, to use uh, linked open data uh, with this. But I'm open to, to, to discussions about, uh, about uh, these uh, conclusions and uh, I'm happy to, to answer your, your questions if there are any. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you for the nice talk and the overview. Uh, well, I have quite a few questions, but uh, um, maybe we could start with a quick round from, from the other panelists and, uh, and then, well, I can jump in and ask things and also ask a question from the audience if you want. Mm -hmm. uh, is there someone, Valeria, do you want to start or? Yeah, sorry. Um, to <laughs> <laughs> sure, I can, I can start. Um, it's, it's not a particularly brilliant question, but um, first of all, Thank you very much. Uh, the, I really, I really enjoyed that, and I'm glad that you covered, uh, in particular, the modeling of events because we, in the past years, we have spoken a lot about modeling places and modeling person data. But I'm really happy that we had, you know, some uh, in-depth uh, examples about modeling events, which are, as you said, uh, particularly problematic. But my questions were. Um, about um, Wikipedia, actually, specifically. And I wanted to ask you, um, why did you choose DBpedia in particular, if I understood correctly, and mm -hmm. what you think are the different, the pros and, co and cons? Mm -hmm. And um, I'm cheating, these are actually two questions. Um, if um, I noticed that sometimes the, let's say, the, the hierarchies uh, in uh, Wikidata and in Wikipedia pages are not consistent. Um, and I wondered if that created some problems in your automatic extraction, especially for events. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, so about DBpedia, um, it, it's mainly due to the fact that the, the, when we started to work on this, it was really 10 years ago. And uh, at the time, uh, there weren't many options. So probably if we had to restart the project now, we would first look at Wikidata. 
uh, and try to to see if uh, we can uh, use information from from there. But at the time, uh, the Wikipedia seemed to be um, yeah the, the best solution because uh, you have a large knowledge base that is completely um, automatic, and then uh, um, it was easy to extend because uh, since there are connections between uh, the Wikipedias among the Wikipedias in different languages, then also the Wikipedia could be um, automatically extended to to cover different languages, starting basically from a shared um, uh, knowledge base. But it's true we we observe the same that uh, that uh, the the categories are really um, a mess, I would say. <laughs> um, so it's it's difficult to to apply strict reasoning uh, using this hierarchy. That's why also we we uh, the the kind of inference that we did was rather straightforward. Um, but we observed that the more we go higher in the categories and we we look for ancestors, the more we find strange uh, strange things. So the levels are not consistent, not always consistent. Um, so this was also a source of errors. Uh, in our um, in our classification and the second question um yeah no i think you answered both thank okay. you <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyone want to jump in other uh, jonathan yeah go ahead yeah could i ask thanks for that it was a really great talk thank you um i was really interested in what you said about de gasperi and the way that his his focus changed through his life to much more contemporary figures. Do you have a sense whether that's characteristic of a politician's life compared to say a mathematician or a painter? Or do you think, um, uh, do you think everyone's life moves in that general direction? I know that's a very, that's a very broad question. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, uh, probably the Gasparis corpus is rather uh, unique because uh, it includes really all uh, the public documents that he wrote throughout his life. So it's difficult to compare with other figures because uh, I don't think there are many archives uh, like this. And uh, probably it's also due to the fact that uh, at the beginning he uh, worked as a journalist and so the corpus includes also the early uh, news that he wrote and he was asked to write about uh, different things, events, uh, um, so not just to follow political uh, life. This could also explain why um, he, yeah, at the beginning he had, say, a broader uh, view and he included more uh, variety of persons and of events in, uh, in his uh, writings. It's also depending on on the, the genre uh, that are a, a bit mixed in, uh, in this uh, corpus. Um, it can be that when we are young, we, when we still have to find uh, our way, we have broader interests. Uh, mm. uh, and then at some point when we decide, probably at some point he stopped talking about Karl Marx. Um, and uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, one of them, I mean, I, I really love the focus on events and I think uh, the discussion that like as a topic is really important in this community, especially, and especially in building this connection between NLP and, and digital history. I mean, events is one of those topics that we always discuss in meetings and we say, oh, it's, we would like to focus on events, but then it's one of those things where like an NLP researcher and, and a historian are actually discussing and thinking about different things when they talk about the events. And so I was, yeah, I, I was wondering, and it's kind of similar to when a, an NLP researcher and a historian discuss about topic and modeling topics, they're actually referring to two completely different things. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why I really love the, the article that you wrote with Rachele, because I think you, you approach it in a, in, in a very broad way, like looking at what people mean when they use this term and what it means to move back to the text and then find events and things like this. So I, I think it's, it's really important. I, I'm wondering... <laughs> In general, and this is a question that we also had for on the audience, if you had any pushback in the collaborations, both like pushback from uh, humanities collaborators that maybe didn't like this type of very text-based approach and very quantitative approach to events, 
but also pushback from the NLP audience when you had to present these approaches to conferences and what was the, the general reaction or? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think that, uh, uh, well, from history scholars, we, we didn't, uh, uh, in the end, we didn't manage to apply this, uh, uh, this paradigm to, to then to, to, to real projects. Um, somehow it, it, it ended, I mean, I mean it ended, then Raquel added a lot of uh, work uh, on top of this because she really, she annotated the corpus and then she trained a system. So there is actually a system that automatically identifies in text events and, and tries to, to assign the categories, the, one of these 22 semantic categories. So it's there and we would like uh, it's available. So we, we would be glad also that people use it and give us feedback uh, but I think there is still a barrier uh, in using this kind of, uh, of technologies uh, because you know it's a, it's a machine learning model and you need to know how to launch it um, so probably we didn't get a lot of feedback because uh, because of this because it's not just an interface where you paste some text and you see your events highlighted somehow um, but it, you still need some technical skills to to make it uh, to make it uh, run and uh, from the NLP community um, we didn't i mean the the the, the feedback was was uh, positive um but as i said it is uh, one of many proposals already already there uh, because there is time mail that is very popular and has a lot of annotated corpora in different languages whereas um our work was focused on on english so uh, yeah, it's, um, I mean, it was, we had a positive uh, feedback, um, but there are still, uh, for example, still uh, uh, NLP people who are more interested in uh, the temporal uh, information, for example, that still prefer uh, time ML, and uh, I mean, it's, uh, uh, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. Uh, Sarah, if you want, you can switch up the, the sharing video. Okay. Yeah, don't worry. Um, if you are okay, people in the panel, I could move on to some of the questions from the audience. But if you'd like to jump in at any time, uh, just feel free. Um, there is one question that I'd like to start on, uh, well, relatedness of events, whether you have ever considered like trying to measure. It's kind of similar to um, uh, disambiguation of events and understanding that two events that you spotted in text are actually the same event. Uh, and at the same time, maybe understanding that there are similar events or uh, events that are like one consequence of other events, whether you have thought about moving in that direction mm -hmm. or... Well, we, we, we consider the FrameNet because uh, I think that it's a great resource and actually everything is already there. There they tried to model uh, uh, temporal order of events, sub-events, entailment relations. So they, they really tried to model everything. Uh, the problem is that they have so much that at some point it's impossible to be consistent. So, um, but... I mean, we, 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 I also worked on FrameNet for my PhD thesis, and uh, I still think that when you work on events uh, from the modeling side and also from the annotation side, it's one of the, the great projects that should be taken as a, um, as a reference. So we didn't want to reinvent something that is already, is already there and that I, I think is great and it's released and it's also part of linked open data. So uh, it covers really all the aspects that we were interested in. Wonderful, thanks. Uh, there's a, another question on, it's uh, mostly related to the thing that you discussed at the beginning on creating a cluster of people and trying to recognize like people that are basically belonging to the same class or the same group because they, they appear together in text. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the question is, well, rather technical in the sense that asks whether the context that you consider is uh, a couple of sentences, a couple of paragraphs, or uh, a number of words. Uh, but in a sense, it's, uh, it's more of a question uh, regarding whether you leverage some uh, type of structure in text, whether you, and how you model text, basically. 
Uh, well, we, we, we did not model explicitly text, but we, we tried a different, uh, with different uh, contextual windows. Uh, for that part, I think we considered two sentences because if we made the context too narrow, then we, we couldn't capture uh, many co-occurring uh, terms. Um, yeah, so the, 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 the narrow window is useful uh, when you model relations, more syntactic dependencies between words, then uh, it's, it's very interesting to, to look at just a few words before and after. But if you want to capture also semantic relations, it's better to, to consider a broader uh, context. So not paragraphs, but I think it was a couple of sentences. That's wonderful, thanks. Um, a few people asked if you could, or maybe, I know that Raquel is also in, if someone could put a GitHub link of uh, the repo where some of these uh, things are, uh, because that, that would be great. Otherwise, we can send it along. Um, there was another question that I partially answered already in the chat, but, but it sounded quite interesting. And it's, uh, ah, yes, in general, the fact that uh, you said at the beginning that you were able to link uh, around 50% of the people and some of them, and, and this is like generally a challenge. When you do linking, uh, you are basically relying on the coverage of the knowledge base. And if there's no way to link this person, well, you have um, missing. Uh, we were wondering, um, how, if you have analyzed the people that you are not able to link and the type of error that you could make when you are inferring their category. You say that you had a precision of over 70%. So mm -hmm. we were wondering about that other 30%. Are you just inferring a category that is maybe too broad and it doesn't really coverage or what type of outlier do you have there? Yeah, sometimes when, as I said, the strategy was to go up in the in the category. At some point, uh, the 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 some common subsumer uh, was uh, just agent or person. So in that case, it was okay, correct, but it was not so not so useful. Um, in some other cases, the coverage was due, yeah, on one hand, uh, uh, the system that somehow failed because. Uh, it, it's a supervised system. So for the, um, the entities that are not well represented in Wikipedia, it means that the system could not see many examples when trained. So it did not learn well to, to recognize some entries. Uh, for some others, it was due to the fact that there are no Wikipedia page for, especially when you go back in time and you have older archives or archives that are not in, in English, uh, then uh, you really have issues with, uh, uh, with the coverage, which which is a, a drawback of using uh, linking techniques, of course. Um, so mainly these are the, the issues. Inconsistency with the, with the Wikipedia categories. Um, yeah. Thanks so much. Um, are there any other questions from the panelists? Or, um, otherwise, we can wrap up with a final one. But in case someone wants to jump in while I'm like, selecting my final one, just like, feel free. Um, I was wondering, uh, in general, on the next steps, because I, I know that people, especially people working in NLP, uh, move across methods and, and move across projects. And so I'm wondering if you are considering in the future to go back and work again on events and, uh, and whether the next time you will approach it, you will approach it. In, in what sense you will approach it differently, whether through a partnership with historians, for example, whether on a specific subcorpus. Uh, I know the, you mentioned the work on Nixon and Kennedy that was very much focused on a specific, in a sense, in a specific event, because it was a single election. So you have a very narrow context around it. So, yeah, mm -hmm. what are the next steps? Yeah, uh, this is a, you give me the, the possibility to give a preview of the Odoropa project. Yeah, it was just like <laughs> drop there, exactly. Thank you. <laughs> No, I mean, for that project, uh, we will, uh, the, the team will be NLP plus uh, semantic web uh, people plus uh, uh, historians. 
and so it will be a mix uh, that is uh, will allow us to 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 uh, develop further the technologies that I presented here. In that case, uh, since the the project is focused on reconstructing the history of Europe through uh, the sense uh, of the past, and so we will identify in texts uh, um, mentions to odors and uh, and uh, smells, um, and there uh, the the research questions. Um, provided by historians are more about broad situations where these odors uh, uh, that are connected to these odors, for example, uh, industrial revolution or uh, uh, medical uh, practices or uh, religious rituals. So probably we will look at uh, uh, broader events or ways to, to model situations that include different sub-events all connected to this kind of, uh, uh, of information. I'm still not sure how we will uh, do it, but this is the, the next, uh, uh, yeah, the next uh, step for us. Fantastic. Thanks so much. Uh, and thank you for, for the people in the panel, the organizers. Uh, thank you. Thank, uh, thank you, thank you for, for inviting me, really. And yeah. also for the interesting questions. <laughs> it was a pleasure. And thank to the audience. Uh, okay, a couple of things before we wrap up. Uh, I lost all my notes, but tomorrow <laughs> we have the, the final uh, thingy meeting again of all the groups and the wrap up of the conference. So come along, enjoy it. Uh, have fun this evening. I have another meeting now. Luckily, I'm not sharing this one, so I can relax a bit. But all, all of you that it's like the end of the working day, please enjoy and, and have a beer or something. Okay. Thanks so much. See you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Bye. Bye.